And we're live. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Captain Future Show. Today with Angelia Cotto. You have to pronounce your name. Cotalessa. Cotalessa. <laughs> it's a mouthful, I know. It's a mouthful, yeah. Yes. Cotalessa. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to talk about uh, what is a polymath and what does it mean and how do we how do we become polymaths and, and why is it that extra important in society, especially now during uh, a societal crisis that we're in. So I'm just going to start up to, uh, uh, with you, uh, Angela, telling tell you uh, our guests a little bit about yourself. Who are you and what do you do? <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, I wear a couple of different hats. I mm -hmm. finished my doctoral degree in human and organizational learning in 2018, and I've remained active um, in the polymath studies field. So I sort of wear a scholar hat, I guess, researcher hat, even though I'm, I'm not working for a university. So I've been speaking and uh, writing and that sort of thing. Um, I'm also a federal employee, so I work for the American government as a non-political civil servant. So regardless of who's president or who's elected, I continue working and uh, I work in leadership development. So I work at the Center for Leadership Development where we offer training programs and organizational interventions to help federal agencies be more effective. I'm also in a family real estate business. Um, I'm in a singing group called the Alexandria Singers. I'm a mom. Uh, yeah, so those are a few of the hats that I wear. <laughs> that, that's, yes. a few, that's a handful of hats, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so that's a little bit about me. Yeah. And uh, why, why, when did you first come in contact with the word polymath or the concept itself? The concept itself, um, you know, I don't remember when I first became aware of it. I remember when I first decided I, I wanted to be that way. And it was because at 18 years old, I moved from the San Francisco Bay Area to Los Angeles for college. And I just happened to take a, a they called it a freshman seminar. It wasn't a real class. It was like a for fun class, no grades or anything. And the professor who taught that class, Professor Eric Trules, who was a theater professor, really made this seminar fun. And the main goal of experiencing this seminar was to try new things. So every week we'd come to this two hour seminar and we would have to share what we tried that was new that week. And I really took it seriously. I felt like I had grown up in kind of a bubble uh, back in the Bay Area. And I, I ended up winning that little competition, not that that matters, but that just shows you how much I was really looking to try new things. And not that that made me a polymath, but that made me realize how much richer life could be when you're just very open to experiences and trying lots of new things. And so when I was 18, I just decided, aha, life is great when you're open and just go with the flow and try new things and instead of, you know, living in a, a bubble and a little narrow silo. But I didn't know the word for it, uh, for living that way or aspiring to be very, very broad. In fact, I didn't even identify the word probably until I was, you know, I was in my doctoral program and I decided I want to study these Renaissance people and what it's like to be them and how do they get to be that way. And in my um, looking in the academic literature, I kept seeing this word polymath. And I, at first I thought, what is that word? I've never even heard of it. People <laughs> don't use that word. I don't like it. So I resisted at first. And then I realized, oh, there's not really a better word that, it, that exists. And it doesn't mean like people get confused because it has math in it. So they think it's about mathematics or something like that. <laughs> it, polymath literally means, uh, poly means many. And math is short for manthanin in Greek, which means to learn or learning. So it just means you've learned a, about a lot of different things. Yeah. And by that time, you just couldn't uh, flip up Wikipedia, read read what you can <laughs> read today on the on polymaths and everything. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and um, I want to say too. So, so that's what polymath means: many learnings. But you know, there's no agreed upon definition of what makes a polymath. Um, and obviously, there's like a range of how polymath. It's not like you're only a polymath if you're a Leonardo <laughs> da Vinci. I mean, there are some people who who will only use the word if you're truly eminent and like uh, yeah. once in a lifetime type of accomplishments. But I don't believe that polymathy is only for the elite. I think polymathy exists on a spectrum, and anyone can choose to kind of unleash their inner polymath if they so choose. Um, 
but there's no agreed upon definition. But basically what it means is that you're not a narrow specialist in your profession. Like you, you may have been a specialist at one time, but you may have become specialist in many different things or combined your specializations. Um, you have breadth and depth professionally. And then of course, a lot of them, uh, polymaths also have breadth and depth in their hobbies and their interests. But the real trademarks of being a polymath are that you're curious, uh, you're self-directed in your learning, a lifelong learner, um, you know, you don't fit in a box, you don't fit in society's prescription, you uh, sort of live outside the box and think outside the box. Um, they're very open to experiences, they've got a lot of tools in their toolkit. So those are just some of uh, the quick highlights of what it's like to be a polymath. Um, yeah, I think it's a great way to live your life. So that's why I studied them. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. So, so let's go to the, re uh, the reason uh, why there aren't so many studies about this or uh, any, why, why isn't it uh, like uh, mainstream to be a polymath? Or is this something that society doesn't want or is this just uh, a hidden niche? <laughs> or Well, in the Victorian era, humans started to really learn about a lot more areas of study. And so it is true that it became harder for any one person to kind of know it all. When there was less to know, it was easier for more, more people to be polymathic. But, you know, the information we have as humans has really exploded over the past few centuries, especially in modern day and with the internet. <laughs> and so we created a kind of division of labor um, with what we can know. And we chose to know more and more about less and less. So we live in this age of specialization. Um, we live in a time where the dominant ideology says, if you wanna be successful, then specialize professionally. Pick one thing that you're gonna focus on for multiple decades and get really good at that one thing and don't worry about the other stuff. Um, but I, I believe that as the world is really getting much more complex now, that that approach is kind of outdated. Like we need people who can see the bigger picture, make connections, really where innovations can occur at this point is not within single silos anymore. It's at the intersection of disciplines where we can really see um, innovations and new knowledge be, be born really. So um, I think we're at a turning point where a, a boom, where polymathic approaches and thinking are really uh, getting a lot more attention. People are appreciating it, uh, seeing the value in it. And also just at a personal level, it's not so nice to feel like you're a narrowly focused cog in a wheel for some people. Maybe maybe there are certain individuals who really like being narrow and focused um, for many decades on one area of professional life, but for a lot of people, they they don't want to be that narrow. They want to experience experience the fullness of their humanity. They want to use all of their capacities, and so um, especially as as sorry, I just keep talking. I could talk. Yeah, go on, go on, keep go on, talking. But, yeah, keep talking. Um, <laughs> as as you know, as tech is becoming more powerful and able to take over some of the grunt work that we used to do. For one of the things I've really given a lot of thought to is, well, what does the role of it of human beings become when tech does more and more of the grunt work? What is the unique value that we can add as humans that makes us different from tech? And Captain Future, I'm guessing yeah. this may be of particular interest to you. Um, you know, I think the way that humans add unique value here on planet Earth is through this sort of synthesizing and bridge building through unique combinations, uh, through our creativity. You know, we can let tech take care of the grunt work now. Let's add unique value through our humanness, through our creativity and innovation by being able to see the bigger picture. Exactly, like you, you hit, you're hitting so many spots of what I'm thinking and talking about as well. So, uh, and like you said, like, you. you when I, I was young, I don't know now, but you couldn't just go to a university, hey, I want to study the course of polymath. And then I want to work, get hired as a polymath uh, at the local town or the local company or something like that. That's uh, not using that word, but the role itself doesn't, didn't exist and it still doesn't. But my theory is now that we actually have to start training and employing polymaths everywhere. Yes, exactly. Because, like you say, society is now so complex. There's new innovations every year. There's new knowledge every year, new science. And who can keep track on all that? It's like it's a lifetime just keeping track on your niche, what's going on. And and 
and people who work and do other stuff, they can spend the f their full day just keeping track of what's happening in their fields. So my theory is that we, in every niche and field, we need polymaths, and then we need all the, the course fertilizers between fields as well. So it's, so it's a million man <laughs> job for what I, I can see. What's your thoughts about that? Yeah, you know, the, you touched upon organizations, and um, mm. and I, I want to address that per in particular because yeah. I think the vast majority of organizations on planet Earth are using old school uh, tools to attract, recruit, retain, and develop mm -hmm. their employees that are based mm -hmm. on the everybody needs to be a specialist model. Mm -hmm. And they're not really, I mean, there are a few organizations that get this, that get, okay, there's two basic types of roles in any organization. There's the role that is routine, stable, there's the role that uh, is not in a VUCA environment, VUCA mm -hmm. meaning volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. You know, a job like accounting is pretty mm -hmm. stable, pretty routine. And so what you, the type of person that you want in that kind of a role would be a specialist, someone who really, really has mastered that role. Mm -hmm. But there are other roles in organizations where it is a harsh environment. It is VUCA on steroids. It is complex, uh, you know, it, it, it's not stable. And so doing things today, like we did them yesterday is not going to work. You have to, to think on your toes. You have to uh, be creative and innovative and, and use a broad toolkit to come up with new solutions. So information security, for example, like, you need people who have a lot of uh, different skill sets and can think across domains to come up with new solutions. Analogical thinking is another thing that's, that's really uh, one of the superpowers of polymath. Analogical thinking is I can take approaches from discipline A that I know and I, I'm good at and apply those sorts of approaches in a new context over here in B. And so polymaths are able to do that kind of analogical thinking because of their broad exposure um, and their, their big toolkit. So organizations, uh, you know, I believe if they get this, if they can figure out, okay, which positions are the ones that are routine and stable and in kind learning environments and which ones are in VUCA, harsh, wicked environments, and then attract hire, retain, develop accordingly because the polymaths are going to do much better in in the VUCA environments and the narrow specialists mm. are going to do better in the stable, kind, everything's routine environments. So if organizations can figure this out and implement it, mm. I think it would really position them well into the complex future that we're in and, and heading into indefinitely um, and, and help them stay alive, competitive, uh, you know, it, it's going to help them adjust yeah, and, to the, the changing <laughs> world we're in. Yeah, and we can see that now that so so few people have has any clue what's going on, and everyone becomes a homemade expert in fields they have no no study in, and and people can't connect the dots all over the world now. And 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 uh, I hang out with a lot of people that are polymaths. So we we are, we're very frustrated when we when people can't see and connect the dots that, that we can. So and like you said, VUCA is a fantastic term. And we came up with a play, uh, the title VUCANist. So you can go to a company, hi, have you, have you any VUCANists here? <laughs> <laughs> I like that, VUCANists. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just to play play with the world and the title. And yeah. as I have a friend here uh, in Sweden who just just two months ago before the corona crisis released her a Swedish trans uh, uh, translation of the VUCA term in Swedish and a book that she she start, wanted every organization and uh, municipality and, and uh, organization here in Sweden to read and understand. So it's, certainly there there is it's on the agenda, but now it's all on hold. But it's it's a moment like this we have a, we would have needed all the people prepared to handle all all the reorganization and all the change in society right now. Exactly. Yeah, the polymaths mm. of the world are very well suited to mm. uh, stand up and and find solutions in the kind of crisis mm. we're in right now. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah, so what what in your 
um, let's talk about bubbles. In your bubbles and fourth fields around this, what, what is the conversation around this topic right now? And describe uh, what, what fields, fields do you visit? What type of events? Where's, where's your daily network around these questions? Well, let me back up a little bit um, to yeah. answer your question. So <laughs> Many question I, in one. <laughs> yes, a lot, a lot to unpack there. So when I was writing my dissertation, I was, a, I was very practical. I was also working full time and I had had a baby while I was a doctoral mm -hmm. student and a dying grandfather I was watching after. And so I was bearing a lot. I was carrying a lot of load on my shoulder. And so my view was I want to do a good job with this disser dissertation, but a, a done dissertation is a good dissertation. I just need to get it done <laughs> and uh, sort of check this box. I was very, very passionate about my topic, but never had any expectation that anybody on earth would look at it, browse through it, nothing. I just thought I'll write it. My dissertation chair, my committee will read it and that will be it. And that's not how this has played out. You know, I, I finished it in 2018. I did post it on a research gate um, in 2019. And I've been you know, people write to me from all over the world. They find me on LinkedIn. I've had people even find my snail mail address for my government job and send me letters and packages. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I've, a couple newspapers have interviewed me and podcasts, and I've been speaking at some conferences. Um, and I just never anticipated the level of interest that, that my dissertation has gotten. By the way, my dissertation was the first and as far as I know, still the only dissert doctoral level dissertation on polymaths in the modern world. So um, what I have seen in my circles, hearing from people all over the world and you know, speaking to them at conferences and that kind of thing is that this resonates deeply with people. It matters to people. There's a lot of frustration that people are not have not been able to bring their whole selves to work, that they've had to censor who they are to sort of fit in, um, or a lot of them have just become entrepreneurs so they can pursue all their interests and 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 be themselves professionally. But in my circles, in ter my circles meaning the people who seek me out regarding Polly Mathy, um, it's really struck a chord and it's been very appreciated. People are starting to feel seen and yes, that, that describes me. That's how I want to be. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I guess to answer your question, it's something that people are hungering for and I don't think this is going to go away. I think we're at the beginning of a, a boom for appreciation for polymathic thinking, polymathic approaches, polymathic living, how it enriches personal lives beyond work lives as well. So I think yeah. we've got a lot more good stuff to come on this. <laughs> good stuff, yeah. yeah. And really soon, hopefully. So we can really start doing it now and not not so we don't go back to business as usual and we forget all about this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to say, like, um, uh, like you said, uh, I typed in the definition of Wukada and uh, you said people who seek you out. That's how I find you. I want to tell that story. I just, I, I read a lot that I'm, I'm constantly curious. I hang on the internet all day, just reading, watching videos. And I, I went into the Polymath Wikipedia page and I saw a, f a, f a friend's name I recognized from Facebook and said, okay. So I went into his Facebook and then, then I found him interviewing you, Michael, I think. Yep, Michael <laughs> Iraqi. Yeah, <laughs> and that's how I find you. So just uh, rabbit holing all, all day, all night here for me, <laughs> reading about about the subjects. And I, I can see other people finding you just searching on polymaths because there aren't that much if you search for videos online. There's there's a few TED talks and stuff like that, but not much. And and yeah. it's really interesting to see how we can like use in the time of internet. Uh, and uh, Zoom calls and video calls. Now people are starting searching for knowledge and finding stuff. Are people ha have people contacted you the, during the last two months of this talking about this stuff, or is with regard to coronavirus? Yeah, and especially uh, like are people searching more for polymaths now? Um, do you notice any change in that? 
You know, I have had I have had a number of people me. reach out to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah like me. I don't know. Maybe people are just at home more and and they're doing the kind of very polymathic <laughs> yeah. internet searching and learning. That's very yeah. super polymathic of you to to go down these rabbit holes and learn. Um, but I I don't know if I've seen an uptick necessarily or connection to coronavirus. But I will say that I think, like I said, polymaths are uniquely situated to help address a difficult problem like the coronavirus, because this is not, I mean, this coronavirus is, uh, you know, a scientific problem. Like we, we need doctors and epidemiologists and, you know, uh, people who can develop vaccines and, and, and that kind of thing. So it's a medical scientific problem, but it's also like a human problem and like a communications problem. It's a government problem, a political problem (laughs) there, you know, there's a lot of different angles here. And so as we meander and stumble through this worldwide crisis, uh, you know, it has to be tackled from multiple different perspectives. And so, for example, if you have someone who who has a background in medicine, but also has uh, expertise in communications and uh, tech and social media, you know, that person may be very well suited to help address the problem um, or come up with creative ways to convey a, a a difficult message to people. So I'm just throwing, I'm just thinking through this as we're talking, but um, yeah. for sure, I think polymaths are well suited. And I think, you know, the coronavirus is one example of a, a wicked worldwide modern problem. Not that, that we haven't had pandemics before, but certainly I, I think as the world gets more, uh, you know, more people, more environmental crises, economic crises, um, you know, we really, really need to think ahead as a species, like how can we prepare ourselves to deal with the difficult problems that are happening now and we know are going to continue to come our way. And one of the ways to do that is to think strategically about, okay, yes, we need some people who are specialists and we need people who aren't. But up until now, I mean, at least the last few centuries, it's really, we've really heard the story that be a specialist, that's how you'll be successful and just fit in that little box. <laughs> yeah. And that's not smart anymore. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And it's also not, people don't want to fit in boxes all the time either. No, no. It's a, uh, like uh, two things there. Like, uh, first, I can say, like, when you say that people, are not allowed to show up as the whole self at work. And that's why you notice now when people actually sit at home that people can show home, show up as they are at home for work. And I, I like I follow some of the talk show hosts and even them have like Stephen Colbert is a favorite and John uh, Oliver. And so even them have transformed when they're at home and becoming more human, more whole. Uh, when like there's family and dogs and kids there and they become a, a more human in that way. and. And I, I can't see them going back after this. This is a transformation in itself. And I hope they inspire a lot of more people as show up as you are. Like you, you're sitting at your, your home, showing off your home, and I'm showing off my home here. And we become more human this way. So this is yeah. an interesting observation I made. Yeah, the, the word authenticity comes up for me. Like yeah. polymath are able to be their authentic selves or, or, or they at least acknowledge to themselves the multiple parts of... Mm of the one cell. So within the one self, there may be multiple selves and uh, it's a way of being authentic. I mean, there may be people who feel really authentic being a narrow specialist like that, Mm -hmm. but that's not everybody. So let's stop telling the story that everybody has to be that way. Cause I mean, it's just not true. Some, I remember one of my interview participants from my research said uh, she had remembered when people asked her as a child, what do you want to be when you grow up? (laughs) And she, her response was, I want to be everything and nothing at the same time. Like there is no, because there's pressure to say one thing, like I'll be a doctor or I'll be a lawyer, but I won't be a combination of things that bring me passion and feel authentic <laughs> to who I am and express my true self. Um, so I, I just remember there's just from the time we're little children that there's this assumption and this pressure that we're just going to pick one thing even from a very young age before we've even had tried to uh, time to sample what's yeah. out there and what the options are like <laughs> okay you're going to be a violin expert start uh-huh. at 3 and then maybe by the time you're 30 you can play in the met or you know some famous opera mm-hmm. house 
Um, and so it's just, I don't know, I just, I, it, it's disturbing to me th that the narrative has been that everyone has to be that way. I, I disagree. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And like, I have had this conversation a lot with the uh, people in education and school and stuff. Like, if if we ask the young to choose an occupation and a young, and they they came, came they maybe know ten or twenty or hundred occupations, but there are literally hundreds of thousand different occupation and expert roles you can play, and and how can they choose one of a hundred thousand when they don't when they know at least a top 100 of them so that's an impossible question in itself i want to be a baker i want to be a fireman like the traditional roles you can like when i grew up <laughs> 40 years ago i didn't know about the hundred thousand roles you could play in society so i had no idea and when people ask me i said i had actually no idea so i didn't want to choose <laughs> and i i put off choosing until i'm <laughs> i'm in my 40s like now so <laughs> yeah and you know when you were saying that i just thought you know, we we go to school till we're 18, mm -hmm. right? And then we, yeah. or most, most countries, I think it's that age. And then many people choose to go to college, maybe even graduate school. Mm -hmm. um, and so we may spend 20 or 30 years in school preparing for a single narrow <laughs> occupation. And the fact is, by the time you get to that profession and you look back on this 30 years of school you've done, and then you go into this new world, like <laughs> the, what you learned is old. And now, mm -hmm. now you have to go into the future. I think what's more valuable is to instill, instill in us this attitude of lifelong learning, of self-directed learning, how to think, how to learn, how to uh, navigate your ship, yourself, your life in a way that feels authentic. Um, and yes, I'm I'm not saying education is bad. Obviously, I have a doctorate. Um, I love learning and I love being in school. But I think beyond just preparing very in a very narrow and specialized way for a career, uh, you know, after school, wouldn't it be nice? Wouldn't it be effective and strategic to also encourage and create an environment in the schools even where self-directed learning was was the way that you you learn and where you learn about um, how to think, you know, how to explore, how to figure out what you don't know. That's just as valuable, if not more valuable, in my opinion, than learning a whole bunch of specialized information that may soon become outdated in the new, the new and complex world. So, uh, you know, being mentally ambidextrous <laughs> like two-handed, right? Being yeah. able to synthesize, see big picture, get in the weeds, but also see big picture, to be able to to do both, um, to build bridges, get out of the cage of specialization. Um, I think that's, like I said, equally, if not more important mm -hmm. than learning very specific technical information, which may, may become outdated. Yeah. And... And the other thing I want to talk about that when you talked about the multiple crisis, so I'm a big uh, fan and also a good friend of Thomas Bjorkman and he talks about what he calls the meta crisis. And he, he also started talking a lot, If I don't know if you know John Bevicke from Toronto University and his whole series on the meaning crisis he put out last year. You should really don't. check, you know, you should crisis. check it out. Okay. Yeah. And a lot of uh, another people calls it insanity crisis, but it's it's just different names on it on the same meta crisis, and people are now starting using the meta crisis because it's in, it it uh, uh, connotates that this is many uh, crises entangled in one. And yeah. uh, Nora Bateson's call about warm data how we how everything is. Uh, complex and contextual and uh, interwoven. So there are many people talking about this. So I put together a blog post where I tried to collect all the people talking about the, the different names and the different aspects of this crisis. And like you said, uh, this is just a conversation that's come up during the last one and a half year. And this mm -hmm. is a conversation we should have a long time ago. But now we can see how we are unable to deal with like uh, uh, the corona crisis in ma on many levels. We were not prepared even like we had been knowing for 2000 years since Marcus Aurelius time that <laughs> pandem pandemics come from the trade routes and like they do today. 
and we should have been prepared 2000 <laughs> 2000 years of preparation for this but not nothing and also uh, there's a, a lot of climate crisis of course energy crisis food crisis i know jack seam who works with uh, well toilet day and uh, clean water and sanitation he does a fantastic job there and it's all interconnected and we have a, the whole mental illness uh, crisis that is big worldwide and especially in the us where you you have like the big pharma uh, and a lot of medications we we hardly take any medications here, here in sweden compared to you we take a lot I, I just recently learned that one million people are on medication in sweden that's one tenth of the population here i didn't know that but it's not uh like in the us but it's coming here as well and and everything is connected that's what john reviki called the meaning crisis we, we we feel like we lack meaning and context for a modern society and become ever more prominent every year and like everything this this speed of change is also speeding up so it's an at least an exponential curve for now that we can see now that there's so much information so many stories so many narratives some of them true some of them fake going on and like and it's all amplifying and spreading social media and internet so we, nobody knows anything anymore and it's even more important now that we have people who can spend deep time uh, whole whole weeks and months just trying to figure out what's going on in a certain situation an event like this yeah exactly as you know i've given some thought to what you're talking about as well with mm -hmm. complexity um and like mm -hmm. the tangled you said the word <laughs> tangled I thought, yeah it is a meta crisis there's lots of different serious crises happening mm -hmm. on our planet um and as we're in this complex system how can I, as an individual member in that system, position myself to be a, a contributor to the greatest extent possible? And for me, the way I feel like I'm going to best contribute in a complex environment or chaotic even environment is by learning as much as I can and having a big toolkit for what may be helpful as I navigate as an individual member. It also makes it, easier for me to make more linkages to other members in the system when I can speak multiple languages. And I don't mean literal languages, but I mean sort of if I can understand different ways of thinking, different approaches, I can make linkages to other members in this complex system. So in, in light of complexity where nobody can predict exactly how the solution is going to occur, and also where no one person is probably going to be able to solve this on their on their own, no country, no organization. <laughs> no. The way that as a species, I oh, think. Wait, wait, that's one guy who has all the answers, right? In your country. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. He thinks he has all the answers. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's funny. Yeah. Well, you know, it, we do live in a complex world. Yeah. And no one person can know it all or do it all but we can certainly try to learn as much as we can so we can contribute and navigate through the tangled mess that we're in so i, I think yeah. there is a link between polymathy and complexity yeah certainly certainly is yeah yeah for sure for sure so tell me captain future do you do you think of yourself as a polymath can you tell me more about your interests and your uh yeah sure sure you you, you're about to ask me questions too yeah this is yeah. <laughs> so like i i uh i've always been interested in like internet communication and that stuff I, since i started watching i think it was ghost in the shell 25 years ago a japanese anime movie that started asking a lot of questions and before that i watched some cyberpunk movies and read some novels around like uh, uh, william gibson's novels of course but how how in an informational age do we make sense yeah. of the world and navigate like an online digital world and then the matrix come and i it blew my mind and i i, I worked in a in the it industry and, and also in the both uh, eSport and board gaming and stuff like that until 2011. So, and then I just started doing so much reading online and watching YouTube videos that be, and started listening to podcasts about this subject, started reading books. And then I quit my job and said, I want to study more how we can build a better society. I didn't know the terms and the words for it, but it came into fruition. So I found some, uh, some way to, to support myself just studying 
because like I said, there was no, I couldn't go to the university and say, hi, I want to become a polymath. I didn't know the word then, but I found out in 2013 about the word and the concept. And I read about the book about Leonardo and everything about this. I said, yes, this is me because I'm, I'm, I'm curious. I'm constantly curious, like a child curious about everything. I can spend hours every day just reading on Wikipedia, watching YouTube videos, podcasts, audiobooks, everything. And I just day after day I can do this constantly and so I would say how can I use my curiosity to learn a little bit about everything but also in this process I, I started learning about the process itself so this becomes my field of expertise how do you the process of spending all um, 10 years all day <laughs> learning stuff uh, that no no one has told you to learn that like mm -hmm. I, I, cho I choose myself what I want to be curious about, and I choose how to connect the dots. And I was really shy 10 years ago, so I did my first public speaking. I got, started going to events, and I had some really good friends who challenged me to do public speaking about this subject and started blogging uh, regularly. And I, and I started first an uh, audio uh, blog about this that I published uh, and then it became a real podcast and we came up a couple of friends of mine came up with the concept of captain future i called myself a rod a lot of other titles like holistic thinking ninja uh, future architect uh, social superhero and stuff like that i started playing with roles and titles i was always interested in superheroes and that and said how can i become a superhero for real like what is my real skills and not just like a pasted on gimmick but the, the true authentic me how can i and Captain Future become the authentic me. And that's what I've been exploring for 10 years now. And I, everything I do is authenticity. Uh, I'm me all the time, most of the time uh, doing this. And I've been going to hundreds of events just all over the world uh, just during the last couple of four years. Uh, started traveling and uh, met some other people also interested in this some some people call it a weaver or navigator or connector and my best friend and partner in this is called Bartola Bastan and he's doing 15 years of uh, study of what he called social capital especially digital how do you connect the dots and all the people and he has a lot of study and theories how do you be big, big social capital and connect people all over the world so he's he's what we call a connector or a navigator so we started calling ourselves navigators because we heard this verbal of people said, how can you navigate the complex world? How can you navigate this field? How can you navigate that? And said, so if there's a verb and an activity called navigating, there must be a, a person doing all the navigating as well. So that's why we started using the word, word, the word navigator for the, the type of polymath activity we do. Wow, I love it. Yeah. I love that you gave yourself creative fun titles <laughs> along the yeah. way too. That's yeah. really really i like that a lot <laughs> that's that's how i've been doing it like yeah i had uh, literally hundreds of <laughs> titles M many of them i've just used for a couple of days when i go to an event that introduce me uh, as this and that and see what happens <laughs> most <laughs> most of the time people don't get it so it's very <laughs> but it's been an interesting experiment so but nowadays i always now i uh, i'm setting captain future because that's what i've been publicly known for through my podcast and all my travels so everyone knows me as captain future now so that's what i use and, and in that captain future is a polymath of course so someone who has a, a, a keen interest on in change complexity society and stuff like that so. yeah that's awesome this visual i get from captain future is that like you're the captain of a ship just going into the future yeah and we used use the ship metaphor navigator I'm captain sure. uh, <laughs> yeah you know i wish everyone sort of took that mentality to be the captain, you know, hopefully people do, but, you know, naming it and saying, Hey, I'm going to be the captain to drive, m drive myself into the future in a thoughtful mm -hmm. and purposeful way. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that's what I wish for, for individual people as well is to just be self-directed and self-author and to mm -hmm. curate their lives and their experiences and to own it and to label it. And like, mm -hmm. you know, I wish for more people to say, Hey, I, I am polymathic or I strive to be polymathic or, I am a polymath because there's something really powerful about giving it a name. Um, yeah. There's some people commenting live. So I show some of the comments here live as well. So, yeah, I love that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, yeah, I think so, yeah and, and uh, like giving this, this title, I thinking also, uh, 
It's also from uh, Buckminster Fuller, who, who wrote the book uh, Operating Manual for Spaceship Earth. And, and he said in a qu famous quote, it has to be all of us and we have, have to become the crew members of mm -hmm. Spaceship Earth. So that's the part, like we are on a spaceship, it's our planet and it's a ship. So then you can be a captain on this ship. So that's that's why I also used to, be, to explore these roles. Yeah, I think right now it feels like that more than ever, at least for me mm -hmm. with, you know, with this mm -hmm. global pandemic. <laughs> um, and we're on this fl rock floating in the middle of space and, you know, we're not an invincible species. Um, you know, we, we are vulnerable in some ways, but I think we mm -hmm. can overcome. But yeah, we all are on this little spaceship Earth together. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, how can we make it a, as best an experience for ourselves and as a collective as possible? Uh, I love that. Yeah. And I just uh, saw the the clip with the pale blue dot, uh, Carl Sagan's quote. It, it's on YouTube, no, the, the official, he, he reading uh, that poem himself. Mm. And that's a fantastic story. We, that we have to have a daily reminder of why <laughs> all, all the bickering and all, all the conflicts and all, all the silly and stupid stuff we do here. It doesn't matter when you, when you even look from the rings of Saturn on this small little pale blue dot that we live on so yeah exactly exactly yep mm -hmm. so there was another question here as well uh, let's find it uh, uh, here you are angela uh, pub has angela published a book or some work um How i i have my doctoral dissertation if you yeah. if you google in pursuit of polymaths called Alessa. It's available huh. for free yeah. on ResearchGate. I may, um, I think I'm probably going to make it available in hard copy because I've had some requests for people who want to be able to purchase it and have mm. a physical book. So be on the lookout. I probably will just do that through Amazon. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so s send me a link and I will share it with people who want it as well. So. Yeah, so that's the main one right now. I do have some other um, projects in the works, which I can't say too much about, but I have some article and another book I'm working on. So um, so uh, be on the lookout for those at some, some point in the future. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess. yeah, and now with that we connected, we're going to start sharing more, more things around this, I think, as well. So, uh, And we can start sharing our networks, I think, because you're, uh, as, as far as... Uh, I know we are uh, we have separate uh, circles and networks in this. I've been part of a large, a couple of large networks that this global run now and hanging in Zoom talks all days with these people all over the world. So, but uh, it's interesting to see what what more networks and bubbles I can come into in this. Yeah, and I do a couple other things. I'll mention. Um, there are some books that exist. Uh, there's a book called The Polymath by Wakwas Ahmed. He published that book, I think it was last year. And there was also a book called Range, Why Generalists mm -hmm. Triumph in a Specialized World. So mm -hmm. that's by David Epstein. That's a book that's out. There's the Neo Generalist, Refuse mm -hmm. to Choose, uh, Sparks of Genius. There are other books that sort of touch on, uh, on these ideas for sure. Um, and also uh, there's a, a scholar from Cambridge Peter Burke, and he has a book called The, the Polymath that's going to be coming out, I think, in September. So there are um, there are some other books out there, for sure. There's not yeah. a whole lot, but they do, you know, there are some. I, I want to mention as well, I've got a, a YouTube channel called Polymath's Place, and it's Polymath yeah. apostrophe S, Polymath's Place, where I, I've posted some videos. Um, yeah, I'll who, find a link to that as well then. Yeah, and I've got a Facebook group called Polymaths Place as mm. well. So if this mm. is a topic of interest to anyone listening, mm. um, those are some additional resources if you want to learn more and or share about your experience as a polymathic person too. Just find others going through similar challenges because that you know that one of the things I I found through my research is that it's not necessarily easy to be a polymathic person. There are some challenges. There's also some very mm. rich rewards that come from living life this way. But, um, you know, we don't necessarily live in a friendly environment for polymaths right now. Mm. Hopefully in the future, it, it will become a friendlier environment to polymathic people. But, <clears throat> you know, I encourage people to connect with others who are polymathic as well, just to share um, 
share experiences and experiences yeah. and get through challenges and uh, share resources, ideas, you know, be in touch with other people like yourselves. Because also another one of the things I found through my research is that most polymaths, um, they realize that they're polymaths because they don't really find a group to fit in. And so they feel sort of um, on a lonely journey in their own polymath uh, path. So what I'm trying to do is to kind of create a community of polymaths so it's not so lonely. So the Facebook group mm -hmm. is an option. Um, yeah, I just group. found out, so I posted it. Uh, awesome. There, so. <laughs> exactly. There it is. <laughs> Great. And it's, uh, yeah. And it's fantastic to see see what else we can learn from this. Uh, uh, had another question here for you. Uh, okay. So, as a polymath, you, you, of course, there's no one polymath alike. But is there? Can you see that there are different groups or different type types of polymaths that uh, you can see the shape of, or something like that? Or is is it just a blur or complex mesh of everything? Um, there are different types of a few, a few things are popping off in my brain. Like for example, some polymaths are polymathic because they, uh, for example, had a career for 10 years in field A and they were a specialist and then they became a, a polymath for the next five years in field B. And then maybe the next eight years they combined A and B or they created A and C or something like that. So just in terms of like, how does someone become polymathic? That is sort of a different, like, are you, uh, you know, doing things one after the other, or are you juggling? That's another mm -hmm. way. Like, yeah, I may have multiple careers and interests and hobbies I'm juggling at the same time, which a lot of polymaths do because they're really, really hungry for mm -hmm. information and for expression. Um, and so that's one way where, you know, there's different types of polymaths, I guess you could say, um, in how did they get there. Um, the other thing I want to say is, there's not been a lot of actual research done on polymaths. If you look in the academic literature, what you'll find is a lot of uh, individual polymaths who are written about. They're mostly um, dead white men. <laughs> of course. Uh, you know, there's not a lot of others written about unless mm -hmm. they were dead white men. Um, and so one of the contributions I hope that my research and my dissertation made was that it was looking at modern day polymaths, both men and women, uh, that we had the best diversity I was able to get as an English speaker um, living in the United States. And, um, and, and we found trends and themes among a group of polymaths. So that's a unique contribution. Uh, and the other thing, you know, I studied real people, not eminent creative geniuses, <laughs> but like real people who are polymathics. Uh, so I wanted to be able to connect to real people that way as well, to inspire people who are this way or want to live this way that no, I'm not saying you have to be Leonardo da Vinci to be polymathic. <laughs> we can all choose to be more polymathic by choosing yeah. to be broad, to explore, to try something new, to try a new approach. Those are all ways that polymaths live life. And so, um, but we need more research. And so identifying more subtypes of polymaths is an area that needs future study. I can see, you know, based on the people I interviewed, that some of them, for example, would be excellent in organizations in leadership positions because they've had broad exposure, they've got great people skills, they can find ways to connect with people, they see big picture, but they can get into the weeds as well. You know, some of them would be great leaders in organizations. And then other polymaths I interviewed, they would never want a position like that. They're much more mm -hmm. introverted. Um, mm -hmm. They just want to, you know, learn and absorb and read and do research. And so mm -hmm. sticking them in a leadership position, for example, would not be a, a good move. So um, I guess what I'm trying to say is I can see that there, that there are going to be subtypes, mm -hmm. but they don't really have names and haven't been studied vigorously <laughs> in that way. Yeah. There's also, you know, Peter Burke talked about like the proper polymath is someone like a Leonardo da Vinci. Um, mm -hmm. 
And then there, he like he sort of said there's like other levels of polymath. You know, there's like a spectrum mm -hmm. or a range of how. So so those types have been addressed. And if you're interested, uh, Peter Burke's article explains the the four different types in more detail. Mm -hmm. So you know, there's we can see there's different types. Like there's people who who got there because of juggling multiple areas at the same time or or back to back um, developing expertise, but not at the same time, or maybe they, uh, you know, they're on this range of how polymathic are they or not, how much depth and, you know, versus breadth do they have. Um, so there's some typology of polymaths that, that exists, but more study is needed for sure. Yeah. <laughs> certainly like and uh, and it's urgent too like and i know these study this take time but there's also like in a, a very acute sense of urgency in society you know in many circles where i talk about this uh i'm part there's a group called the emerge uh, network that's part, uh, mostly europe but some us as well and there's uh, a network that's circled around the podcast Rebel Wisdom. And there's another podcast called Future Thinkers. They're all intertwined. But th these are people who are all familiar with John Vavik and Thomas Bjorkman and all, 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 all that type of, type of language. And there's a network in the US called Game B that is a big uh, Facebook group as well, asking uh, very big questions. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Jim Roth and Jordan Hall and Daniel Schmattenberg. Yeah, Any I know Jordan. You know Jordan, yeah. Mm -hmm. So he's part of Game B, and also he's been a lot of talk just the last couple of months, like four, or three, four, or five talks about the crisis. Now he's a, yeah. it has an excellent talk with him and John Mavike that blew my mind, so and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Awesome! I'll, I'm gonna look for that video. Yeah, that's, what, that's the stuff I spend all days now watching, reading, thinking about. So. Awesome. Yeah. Well, good for you for being, you know, a continual lifelong learner and breaking out of the box, making your yeah. own new world and boarding yeah. your captain future boat. I love it. Mm. So uh, any, any more things you think about uh, about uh, this? Yeah, what, what's, what's the next step? What do you see as the next step? With, you said we'd have to do a lot more research. So uh, what is the long focus and the short focus on this, you think? With two questions uh, there. Yeah. Um, well, we need more people to study for sure and write about this. We more need more people to speak about it, to spread awareness about it. Um, I, and like I said, I think we're at the beginning of this kind of boom where it is gaining traction and awareness, especially as the world becomes more complex. Um, but we, we need more awareness because there's still lots of people who don't know the word, don't really think about being this way, just sort of follow the standard prescription of being a specialist. Um, and there's a lot of organizations who don't think strategically about how they can leverage the talent and the superpowers of polymathic people. Um, so spreading awareness, I think that's both long-term and short-term. <laughs> Just keep keep talking about this, keep writing about it. Um, so I'm trying to think what else, you know, I'm hoping to, like I said, I've, I've started this Facebook group to try to create a sense of community and I have hopes to do more of that in the future. I have um, started working as a coach. And so um, hopefully soon I will be begin offering more coaching services to people who, who are polymathic and would like some support on their goals and just sort of navigating through the challenges and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, just talking about it more, being strategic about yeah. it on an individual, uh, you know, at the micro, meso, yeah. macro yeah. levels. Yeah. Let's uh, be strategic about how we can leverage our unique human capacities in strategic ways um, at all of those levels. One other thing I'd like to add to that I wrote about in my dissertation um, is about intrapersonal diversity. And I think this yeah. was a, a kind of a, a unique contribution that my research made, which is, you know, when, when we think of diversity in, in, in humans, what we think about is if you have a group of people, you want it to be diverse. So you have different representation, different perspectives, different ways of thinking. And there are many benefits of having a diverse group. There are, there are also challenges. Um, but the diversity construct needs to become more diverse because diversity doesn't only exist when you look at a group. Diversity can exist within one person. 
I can be diverse. In fact, in the academic literature, you can find articles. Uh, the first articles that started using this word intrapersonal diversity were about the gut microbiome. So I take I take probiotics, and so I hope that I my gut microbiome is very intrapersonally diverse. Um, but human diversity at the individual level doesn't only exist in the gut. It can exist in the way that you live your life, and and that's by being a polymath. A polymath is someone who is intrapersonally diverse. They have diverse skill sets, diverse knowledge, diverse experiences um, as a professional and as just a, a person living their personal lives as well. So the idea of intrapersonal diversity is something I like to talk about and share. So that's something that I hope will also gain more traction in the short term and the long term too, is that when we think about diversity, we don't just think about it as a group and looking at race and, and sexual orientation and gender identity and those sorts of yeah. things, which matter and are great and need attention too. But let's also, th you know, think about how an individual can be diverse and how that can <laughs> matter and make a difference and be a strategic, uh, it can be strategic for us as well. Yeah. Very interesting. Like you said, I read some book and seen some talks about the importance of a diverse team and everything. But like you said, they, they don't even mention like that each person can be diverse in itself, playing yeah. different roles at different times and having different fields of knowledge that combine with, uh, uh, with a complexity uh, in a group as well. So it's very interesting that you say this. So, and this is like something we have to, uh, of course, study a lot more and become much more familiar with this uh, this aspect of being human yeah exactly at the end of the day you know we we have this life we don't know if we get any other lives uh, <laughs> we don't know we just don't no. know but we know we have this one and so how mm. can we make the most of our human experience and exactly. Yeah. exactly and i think at least for me, the way that I make the most of my human experience is by having the full human experience, trying <laughs> lots of things, mm -hmm. self-authoring and curating my own experiences thoughtfully mm -hmm. rather than just sort of receiving whatever comes my way. And that's fine too, but you know, I want to feel like I lived my life well as best I could. And polymaths are a great example of people who are doing that, who are self-authoring their own lives and being authentic mm. and unleashing their superpowers and mm. being creative and learning and growing and improving and reaching towards self-actualization. And so I think polymaths are a great example of how to live life well. Yeah. And I, and I know a lot of my friends are big fans of Robert Keegan and his talk about the self-offering mind. And this, of course, of course comes, comes, comes into this concept of the diversity within when you, we can start to self-offer your own different sides and different uh, parts of yourself. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, I think that's what we're here to do is express who we really are, learn, yeah. grow, yeah. express the best version of ourselves that we can, <laughs> make a contribution. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So it's been awesome talking to you. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. It's yeah. And, uh, and I, I have group conversation or, around these topics as well. So you're welcome back, especially yeah. with Floris uh, Coot is a regular guest of mine. And uh, I would I would love to see a conversation between you, between you and Floris. Yeah, <laughs> I can see you speaking of all that. So I'll, I'll set that up in the f near future if, you, awesome. if you're interested. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. I, that sounds great. Yeah. And uh, let's continue from here. I, I'll join your Facebook group and I'll send you some links and you send me some links and we start learning even ex even more exploding this learning now. I feel like during the last, last, say, six weeks, I've been deep diving into this aspect of myself and the society. Yeah. So. I love it. Mm. Sounds good. Well, good for you for doing yeah. all that. All right. Yeah. So bye, everyone. And thank you for staying with us in the live conversation. If, if you're watching this afterwards, uh, uh, reach out to me and Angela. Join the Facebook group, uh, Polymaths Place. And let's talk more about this because it's certainly a, a topic that we need uh, millions of people talking about all over the earth right now. How we can, uh, in this moment on earth where we, where we have press some pause buttons and we don't want to get go back to business as normal and we have we have to become more human this is a perfect opportunity to explore this further i think yeah i love it mm -hmm. thanks everyone
and thanks. Bye. Bye.